The worst year in WWE history. It's something which I myself have pondered from time to time. Just, just what is the worst year? Um, to me, when I look at the worst year, I view this as Raw. I view this as SmackDown. I view this as the main roster pay-per-views. I don't incorporate developmental into this. Um, to me, this is just what we are presented on Raw, SmackDown, and pay-per-views. So for this, I don't know how long this video is going to go. I've written down all of the positives, the pros from 2019 and all of the cons. Um, the list of pros is 13 items long. The list of cons, I have to keep scrolling and scrolling and scrolling. So I don't know how long this is going to take, but I think you guys are going to enjoy this because this is going to be in some ways confronting, in some ways scathing. I'm going to go through now three and a half, four years removed from 2019 coming to a close. I'm going to critically break down what we got in that year. So I'm going to start with the cons and then I'll get through to the pros at the end. For starters, the men's Royal Rumble was absolutely abysmal. Um, this was, in my opinion, one of the all-time bad men's Royal Rumble matches. Uh, you had a final four of Seth Rollins, Braun Strowman, Andrade El Idolo, and Dolph Ziggler. If that doesn't scream like mid, I don't know what does. Just a weak, weak field. Um, it really was. And speaking of the Royal Rumble, the marathon length Royal Rumble pay-per-view itself, the main show was five hours long. Are you kidding me? And this was a trend in 2019. These big pay-per-views, mainly in the first half of the year, this Royal Rumble was a five hour main show, or sorry, four hours 40 if you want to be specific. And then the kickoff was, what, two hours? Just too damn long. Honestly, just, just cut the crap, WWE. Absolutely cut the crap. Then we move on with these February pay-per-views, super forgettable filler pay-per-views. Elimination Chamber, Fast Lane, quite literally make like one worthwhile match on each show, and the rest is absolute filler. If I ask you to tell me what happened at Fast Lane 2019, the hardcore fans will tell me Daniel Bryan had a great triple threat match, which I'll get to in a minute. But what else happened? Nothing. You know, complete filler. So there's that. Also, I'm not even mentioning any bad angles on Raw, any bad angles on SmackDown. If I wanted to do that, I could be here for literally about two hours. If I wanted to break down week to week, just the bad stuff they did on Raws and SmackDowns. This is just like the main stuff that I remember four years in advance and the pay-per-views. So that being said, WrestleMania 35, eight hours long, unforgivable. You had people out there in New York who were literally, they, they got to the arena for the start of the kickoff show at like 4 p.m., 3.30, 4, 5 p.m. And they're still sitting there past midnight when the show is still going on, like 30 minutes past midnight the next day when they're doing this women's triple threat match, which we'll get to later. Like that is unforgivable. No WrestleMania should be eight hours long on one night. Th that is a joke as an event. That is an absolute joke. And speaking of WrestleMania, a lot of filler, a lot of fluff, as I, you know, as I allude to with it being eight hours, but the big one, Baron Corbin retiring Kurt Angle. Baron friggin' Corbin of all people, this is when he was like the constable at this stage. It's around the time where the Shield are sort of having these matches where Bobby Lashley, they're feuding with Drew McIntyre, it's a bit all over the place. Baron Corbin just retires Kurt Angle. Okay, um, and also around this time, I mentioned Dean Ambrose and the Shield there, the exit of Dean Ambrose in early 2019. Obviously, they were trending in the direction of having Dean Ambrose just like get buried on his way out the door when they had him tease a match with Nia Jax and they were teasing that he'd face to Drake Maverick, like guys who were just below him, objectively. Um, but then just generally the exit was, it just felt a bit messy, a bit forced. That was my opinion. Um, speaking of exiting, Sasha Banks walked out after WrestleMania. Uh, this was a big story. Sasha Banks, fresh off winning the women's tag titles with Bayley and then dropping them a month later to the Iconics. Um, fellow Aussie acts, and Peyton Royce and Billy Kay at WrestleMania, Sasha was so disgusted creatively, she just walked out. And that became one of the big sort of negative backstage stories of WWE that year. So that happened. And then we look around, you know, a few weeks later, AEW by this point has all this momentum, double or nothing's coming up. You even have Sami Zayn mention AEW by name on Raw. That just happened. And then we get the Money in the Bank pay-per-view. There is no buzz whatsoever. WWE hit the panic button. They do Seth Rollins versus AJ Styles, which I'll get to later. It's one of the, actually the positives of the year. 
But elsewhere, Money in the Bank pay-per-view that was so bizarre, the show ends, Money in the Bank this is, ends with this Money in the Bank men's ladder match. Brock Lesnar just comes out and just throws Ali off a ladder and wins. So random, just ridiculous. And then we go to Saudi Arabia a few weeks later, and we've got The Undertaker and Goldberg nearly, quite literally, killing each other on pay-per-view. Deep in the heart of Saudi Arabia, WWE put on one of the worst matches in the history of their company. As The Undertaker nearly paralyzes himself, and Bill Goldberg busts his, open, busts his head open on a door backstage, and then nearly gives himself CTE in the actual match from going headfirst in the ring post on a botched spear. Truly bad. Truly, truly bad. And then speaking of truly bad, also at this time, Seth Rollins was in a Universal Championship storyline with Baron Corbin. Just what you want to see in the main storyline in WWE. A babyface Seth Rollins with hardly any momentum feuding with Baron Corbin, who was the, apparently the top heel in the company at the time. Uh, this storyline also factored in Becky Lynch and gave us the infamous Seth Rollins man's man shirt. Who can forget that? Uh, and it gave us Baron Corbin and Lacey Evans trying to be this top tier dominant heel act in WWE. That's where we're at in 2019. Nowadays, we've got the Bloodline, Roman, all this stuff. We've had that for the last year. 2019, we've got Baron Corbin and Lacey Evans sticking it to the man's man, Seth Rollins, and two belts, Becky. Like, just bad. Speaking of just bad, Lars Sullivan was getting pushed at this time. He was squashing people left and right. He squashed Lucha House Party at a pay-per-view. That happened. Um, in the WWE title picture, we had Kofi Kingston and the infamous It Should Have Been Me feud with Dolph Ziggler. Who can forget that? Dolph Ziggler literally coming out bitching and bitching and bitching and just carrying on. It should have been me! It should have been me! What compelling main event storytelling. A literal mid-carder for life telling another literal mid-carder for life. It should have been me! Amazing. Then we move on. The Stomping Grounds pay-per-view records one of the absolute worst WWE pay-per-view attendances in many years, large sections of the arena were tarped off to try and cover the poor ticket sales and the poor, like they literally had to give out free tickets for this show. I think if I had to, memory serves me correct, they sold about 3,000 tickets and they had to give out tickets for free to get this to about five or 6,000 from memory. Correct me if I'm wrong, but that was just not great. And speaking of stomping grounds, I'd argue this was the most forgettable WWE pay-per-view of modern times. Can you tell me one match from Stomping Grounds 2019? I'll give you a few seconds. If you can think of a match from Stomping Grounds 2019, your name's not Art Carter. I mean, fair play to you, but freaking hell, like Stomping Grounds 2019, what, what a memorable event. Then we move on, speaking of memorable, who remembers Shinsuke Nakamura's 200 and plus day IC title reign, where he defended the title, what, three times? He began by beating Finn Balor on the kickoff of Extreme Rules and then he defended it, what, at Night of Champions, I think? And he defended it, like, one other time. And he held the title for literally seven months. One of the worst Intercontinental Championship reigns ever. Truly bad. Um, WWE did a Smackville thing. That happened, okay. Um, SummerSlam, so the second biggest event of the year. It wasn't seven hours long, so... <laughs> Fair play, WWE there. Um, but it didn't feature Roman Reigns. It felt thrown together. I remember watching vividly at the time. This was a thrown together event. Uh, the main event was Seth Rollins, a babyface Seth Rollins facing Brock Lesnar in a rematch of WrestleMania where Seth Rollins just squashed Brock Lesnar in two minutes. Okay. Uh, Seth Rollins in the build to this SummerSlam match was quite literally crying every week saying, oh, I need to overcome the beast. Seth Rollins, the infamous promo which got hated on where he gets beat up by Brock Lesnar. He's literally crying, leaning against the rope. He literally has tears in his eyes. I'm not joking. Crying about having to face Brock Lesnar. So that happened. Uh, then we move past SummerSlam. Seth Rollins and Braun Strowman win the Raw Tag Team Championships. Uh, furthermore, just generally speaking, the Raw Tag Team Division and the Tag Team Division and Tag Team Wrestling generally in 2019 on the main roster for WWE. Horrific. Just bad. Um, I remember the Eric Rowan and Daniel Bryan team was decent and they had heavy machinery on SmackDown. That was okay. <laughs> you know, the early stages of heavy machinery with Otis and Tucker. 
But really, tag team wrestling was a mess at this stage. You had Dolph Ziggler and Robert Roode were tag team tag team champions. Seth Rollins and Braun Strowman won the Raw tag titles. Um, that happened, and then Seth Rollins and Braun Strowman main evented Clash of Champions for the Universal Title. Okay. Um, then from here we had what the Who attempted to assassinate Roman Reigns storyline on SmackDown, where Roman Reigns ends a SmackDown as the big dog strutting through the backstage area only to have a mysterious structure fall on him. You got, you know, the interviewers cry, like screaming, crying, EMTs are running over. This just weird, unnecessary bit, you know, turn of events. You had Eric Rowan with a doppelganger, some ginger with a beard. Daniel Bryan was just involved in this because of course he was. Luke Harper came back at a pay-per-view. They had a match. It was, okay, like, there were some okay parts of this, but it was just very, very random, very strange. A very anticlimactic storyline, which started off with a bit of promise. And then speaking of anticlimactic, Kofi Kingston's WWE Championship reign, six months ago, is not great. It should have been me storyline, the Samoa Joe storyline, eh. And then you get to this, um, the Friday Night Smackdown on Fox premiere, Brock Lesnar squashes Kofi in eight seconds. And the IWC, specifically a few YouTubers, if you want me to name them, I'll name them in the comments if you want to, you know, want me to name you YouTubers who did this. Call out WWE for racially holding down Kofi Kingston, racial profiling, burying a black superstar in eight seconds, and calling WWE and Vince McMahon racist. I'll never forget that night. I remember the backlash and the uproar in the YWC on that night um, after Brock Lesnar squashed Kofi. So that happened. WWE was blame for racism um, and then within literally about a week of that we get Hell in a Cell who can forget that when they ended a Hell in a Cell match and the Hell in a Cell pay-per-view with the fiend this scary menacing nightmare from hell fiend losing by referee stoppage because Seth Rollins was threatening to hit a toolbox and a ladder that was sitting on top of the fiend Bray Wyatt with a sledgehammer okay so they end a Hell in a Cell match via referee stoppage, the same structure where Mankind was thrown off by The Undertaker and Mankind nearly died three times in one Hell in a Cell match. That same match that was pioneered by legends like Foley, Undertaker, Triple H, guys like that, it ends with Seth Rollins crying and threatening to hit Bray Wyatt with a toolbox and the referee was like, oh my God, it's too much. And they ended a Hell in a Cell match in DQ. And speaking of Hell in a Cell, they had four matches announced for that pay-per-view, literally as it was starting. They threw together three matches totally randomly. It goes to show you how just messy behind the scenes WWE was at this time. They ended up doing a Randy Orton and Ali match, 17 minutes it went, for no reason on pay-per-view. 17 minutes. The, 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 literally no story, no, it was a 17 minute Randy Orton match against Ali, that just happened. So yeah, Hell in a Cell, that ending, my god. Um, and then we move on, who can forget this? Baron Corbin won King of the Ring. So we had King Corbin, which infamously led to the uh, Baron Corbin, Roman Reigns storyline in late 2019. Once Roman Reigns had conquered the evil Braun Strowman, not Braun Strowman, Eric Rowan and his doppelganger and Luke Harper, who tried to kill him two months prior, we had Roman Reigns running around, punching big dog mascots and pouring dog food on Corbin and Corbin Ziggler, Rude, FTR they pour dog food on Roman and the, the baby face Usos who you still at that stage couldn't tell apart from each other they were coming to the defense of right it was just I couldn't believe what I was watching I really couldn't um, and you get around this October time as well who can forget this Tyson Fury and Braun Strowman when they ended a Raw having one of the worst brawl segments in the history of wrestling. Tyson Fury, the heavyweight champion in the world, who's quite literally TKO'd Deontay Wilder, a guy who's pretty much undefeated in a whole career. Tyson Fury TKO's Deontay Wilder twice and pretty much beats him three times outright. That guy, Tyson Fury, the heavyweight boxing champion in the world, is Shane McMahon punching Braun Strowman to close an episode of Raw. You've got the whole roster out there. They can't stop this. It's an absolute free-for-all, one of the worst Raw endings ever. That happens. Um, as well as that, if th that main event wasn't compelling enough for Crown Jewel, look at this. 
Brock Lesnar versus Cain Velasquez. Ho, ho, ho. A washed UFC fighter versus Brock Lesnar for the WWE title. What a way to carry on momentum after Brock squashes Kofi Kingston in 8 seconds. Ho, ho, ho. Ho, ho, ho. Great one, Vince McMahon. So, yeah, WWE was... They're really firing on all cylinders in October. Brock squashing Kofi in 8 seconds. One of the worst Hell in a Cell endings. Or, sorry, the worst Hell in a Cell ending ever. And one of the worst pay-per-view endings ever. Raw's ending with the World Heavyweight Boxing Champion air swinging against Braun Strowman in a brawl. Kane Velasquez feuding with Brock Lesnar for the WWE title. King Baron Corbin. WWE was hitting home runs left and right, so you get that. And then WWE has their aircraft fail deep in the heart of Saudi Arabia. There was airline failure after the Crown Jewel pay-per-view. Your wrestlers stuck at the airport looking depressed, as it's, this picture shows here, in the middle of the night, at like 1am in Saudi Arabia, WWE hits the panic button, and I'll get to what that led to. But that said, we get the Survivor Series, and we get the first of two, within the space of a month, pointless, random, forced women's main events. The Survivor Series main event, Shayna Baszler, Becky Lynch, Bailey, flat, okay, mediocre, Rush, like just match went for 15 minutes everyone was thinking Ronda Rousey would come out she just didn't come out and it, the match just ended so that was Survivor Series and then a month later we had the Kabuki Warriors versus Becky and Charlotte for the women's the women's tag team titles main evented TLC so that happened and there was a Starcade pay-per-view the event thing house show whatever that, that happened uh, and who can forget the infamous Lana Rusev Bobby Lashley love triangle we can forget this, where Rusev was being cucked out on live TV as Lana is sleeping with Lashley's BBC, quite literally on television. That happened. We had literally Jerry Springer segments, where Jerry the King Lawler was crying in the ring with Jerry Springer as Rusev is watching his wife kissing Lashley. Wasn't that fantastic? Who can forget that? Who, who can forget the wedding segment? to close 2019, the final segment of Monday Night Raw and WWE main roster content in 2019 and the whole 2010s decade was WWE having Lana and Lashley have a marriage, have a wedding. Lana had Bobby Lashley's, like, his makeup get on her face. Her face was, like, brown for a bit. You had Liv Morgan jump out of a birthday cake and reveal herself as... Like, it was just one of the worst segments I've seen. It went for like 35 minutes as well. This went so long. This whole wedding segment. So that was that. Um, and I touched on Darren Corbin and Roman Reigns, that thing before. Dog onesies, dog food, Ziggler, Rude, Corbin standing tall every week on SmackDown. Some of the worst SmackDowns I've, I've ever seen to close round out 2019. Who can forget this? Baron Corbin pinned Roman Reigns at TLC 2019. That, that deserves a mention. That's the last time Roman Reigns has been pinned and that was over three years ago now. That happened. Um, not to mention, there was not one great pay-per-view that happened in 2019 from the WWE main roster. Objectively, not one pay-per-view that is worth going back to watch. Um, there were ratings having like going through the floor. Becky Lynch's run did no wonders for ratings. SmackDown, the quality of that show was no good. Raw was brutal to sit through. There was just so much bad. And then I'll get to the con. Oh, sorry. I'll get to the... I've been doing cons for 20 minutes. I'll get to the pros now. The pros, Roman Reigns announcing he's in remission. One of the all-time feel-good moments in wrestling. Just an objectively amazing moment. Um, Daniel Bryan's WWE title matches and his run as the Planet's Champion generally. Um, that was the most entertaining stuff in the early kind of going of the year. Planet Champion Daniel Bryan with Eric Rowan. Um, Bryan's Elimination Chamber title defense against Kofi Kingston and friends. That was really good. And his fast lane triple threat match against Ali and Kevin Owens. Super underrated match. Uh, Becky Lynch and her momentum in the first few months of the year. Definite highlight. Um, that whole angle they did with her and Ronda, they added Charlotte Flair in. That had real heat, the fact they added Charlotte in. That was all pretty good stuff with Becky Lynch. Um, Kofi Mania generally, that sort of six to seven week burst in February and March with Kofi Kingston had all the momentum in the world. That was really good. Um, as was Seth Rollins versus AJ Styles and Money in the Bank. Really enjoyable match. Um, Boombox Brock 
dancing with the Money in the Bank briefcase on Raw the night after Money in the Bank was just great content. Um, Extreme Rules was the only good pay-per-view. You know, that was the only show worth really watching from a pay-per-view standpoint, Extreme Rules. Uh, we had the debut of The Fiend at SummerSlam. That was the big moment from SummerSlam. The Fiend debuts and squashes Finn Balor, who was in his tidy whities I remember that. As well as that at SummerSlam, Trish Stratus' performance, really good. Um, next as well, Sasha Banks' return and feud with Becky Lynch in September and October. The only good thing that happened in WWE on the main roster in September and October 2019 was Sasha Banks' feud with Becky uh, and their matches they had. The first one at Clash of Champions ending in a, a screwy finish, whatever. The Hell in a Cell match is really good. And not to mention NXT invading SmackDown. That, that infamous SmackDown episode, as I mentioned, half the WWE roster or even more is stuck with aircraft failure in the heart of Saudi Arabia. So you had the NXT crew step in, Adam Cole, Daniel Bryan, all this other NXT stuff. That was really good. Um, Survivor Series, as a result, was fresh and entertaining. How they put over Keith Lee that night, really good. And Alistair Black vs. Buddy Murphy was really, to me, the only highlight of the Paul Heyman era for Raw. People look back on that fondly, it wasn't that good. Like, Drew McIntyre was booked all right. Alistair Black and Buddy Murphy was good. That was really it from a holistic standpoint. So, yeah, there you go. 2019, the worst year in the history of WWE. That's, I think, objective. So, yeah, if you enjoyed the video, like, comment, sub. This is Andrew.